Dr. Harrison Schmidt flew in space as Apollo 17's lunar module pilot, landed at the moon's valley of Taurus Littrow in 1972. He collected, documented, and returned 240 pounds of lunar samples. He's the only scientist, BS from Caltech, PhD in geology from Harvard, and the last of 12 men to step on the moon. Elected to the United States Senate from Mexico in 1976, among other things, Senator Schmidt chaired the Commerce Subcommittee on Space and Technology. He later served on President Reagan's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, the Army Science Board, and President George Herbert Walker Bush's Ethics Commission. He also chaired the NASA Advisory Council and was a director of Orbital Sciences Corporation and Orbital ATK for 35 years. He currently serves on the National Space Council's User Advisory Group. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Harrison Schmidt. Try to have a little bit of fun first in the tradition of uh, getting people to scramble for their moon ball. <laughs> Quick! <laughs> okay. Well, that was very exciting. <laughs> And uh, Christine, I, I have to tell you that there must be a connection between New Mexico high schools and Carolina high schools in that uh, I had to pay my math teacher for Algebra two. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, Caltech wasn't going to uh, pay any attention to my application. What, uh, also, I want to thank USRA for uh, literally uh, 50 years of association off and on. I took a little time off to go into the Senate, but uh, through the years I've spent a lot of time uh, in various ways. And in the early days, uh, a lot of time with Paul Coleman, and his name hasn't been mentioned yet today, but Paul was a major instigator of the success, I think, of USRA. And in the uh, biomedical research group that we put together, uh, Bobby Alford of Baylor, Dr. Alford, was uh, really a, a, a major uh, Force in that effort. And I couldn't help uh, when Marsha talked about uh, the Space Science Board to remember Harry Hess, who chaired the Space Science Board back uh, in the Apollo days and was responsible for, uh, and largely responsible for convincing NASA, although there were proponents in NASA as well, that they should have a, they should bring scientists into the astronaut program. And so uh, all of those connections came to mind as I listened today. The, uh, what I wanted to do was to, uh, first of all, just uh, give you an idea of what an Apollo mission was like. And, but I'm gonna stick in the middle of it a little bit of new integrated science that uh, I've been working on with, uh, and we'll see if uh, it's of any interest to you. The, uh, of course, the enabling technology for Apollo was the Saturn V rocket. Uh, three stages, 364 feet high, fully fueled, weighed uh, 6.8 million pounds, seven and a half million pounds of thrust in that first stage, just a remarkable accomplishment. And if we expect to do these things in the future, we're gonna have to have a rocket like that. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, but we need to work that way. To give you an idea of the scale here, in the lower right-hand corner, uh, next to the vehicle assembly building is a very large fire truck, <laughs> red fire truck. Just, you, gotta, you always have to have some perspective of scale when you start talking about Apollo. And there's our uh, particular Saturn V, which functioned uh, perfectly, uh, taking off from the Kennedy Space Center. It, uh, of course, it was a night launch. I missed it. Uh, <laughs> but some of you might have seen it, I hope you did. And if you look very carefully on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the uh, second stage, you see some bright spots. Those are chunks of ice or frost that have come off the rocket uh, 
due to this very, very heavy low frequency vibration that's uh, generated by the five F1 engines in the first stage. Uh, we sat on the launch pad for two hours and 40 minutes uh, while uh, in about five minutes they diagnosed a problem, a mismatch, uh, miscommunication between the launch control computer and the rocket. Uh, the rocket actually was ready to go, the launch control computer just didn't know it. Uh, and, uh, and then a, a better part of two hours to convince management that not only did they know what the problem was, but they knew how to fix it. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with that. Two hours in the Apollo programs was a lifetime. I mean, everything happened very, very fast, as you may uh, well. And it's really one of those things that we have to think about when we uh, talk about the management environment uh, for uh, returning to the moon and going on to Mars. It, uh, it really needs to replicate much of what we had during Apollo. And particularly, it needs to be young. That environment needs to be young. The two spacecraft we had, of course, the command and service module. Ours was outfitted with uh, remote sensing devices that Ron Evans used uh, in orbit, and the last three missions actually uh, collected a great deal of new information about the lunar surface with those instruments. Uh, and the Challenger uh, lunar module uh, down on the surface uh, worked extremely well, never looked much like a Buck Rogers machine, but uh, didn't need to. It never had to operate in an atmosphere of any kind. And uh, those of you who might have been associated with uh, the Grumman's uh, Aircraft Corporation at the time, they uh, spent an awful lot of time trying to get the mass of that vehicle down to where it actually could land on the moon, and uh, subsequently did it very well. The, uh, I just, I, uh, the, hmm, oh, there it is. There we go. This uh, photo was part of a long series of photographs that I took as, to document weather observations, and somehow it got pulled out as, a, as the most requested NASA photograph in the archives, I'm told. Uh, as you can see, uh, the southern hemisphere weather patterns are extremely well defined for us. Uh, and for the three days, uh, three and a half days going to the moon using a 10 power monocular part of that time, I was, uh, I really had a great, great time being an amateur meteorologist. And uh, it, uh, it is a, uh, if you ever have a chance to uh, participate in, in going to the moon, we'll spend some time looking at the Earth. It's really quite <laughs> remarkable. Our uh, destination was a, a valley uh, that penetrated, radially penetrated the Basin uh, surrounding mountains of, of the Serenitatis uh, Basin, a 740 kilometer diameter basin, uh, one of those uh, of the many large basins that formed on the moon early in its history. And I emphasize that early uh, because that is the part of Earth history that we never had available to us until we began to study the moon. And today there still is really only one thing in Earth on Earth that we see that tends to record some of that history, and that's a little mineral called zircon. And uh, we, uh, uh, it's a remarkable mineral, but uh, other than that, we don't see, we really did not have any idea of what the environment of the Earth was like, the space environment, until we began to study the moon. If, I, I still list that as the, one of the fundamental uh, scientific accomplishments of Apollo, and, it, and actually we would have pretty much had that accomplishment had we never gone to the moon after the Apollo 11 mission 50 years ago. Fortunately, we did go back to the moon and learned even more about not only the moon, but the Earth itself. Just for perspective, that's the separation of the first and last Apollo missions. About 600 kilometers, we were a little farther uh, uh, east and certainly farther north than the Apollo 11 landing site. Uh, and, uh, uh, um, and, and really in a very, very different environment uh, than uh, what Neil sampled for us uh, 50 years ago. The first view I had of the far side of the moon after we entered lunar orbit is, is this, and it's a pretty good representation. As a matter of fact, uh, the digitization of the Apollo Hasselblad photography has gone extremely well. Uh, 
I spent some time after my mission, a few, a few a couple weeks after the mission, actually looking at the prime film with a small uh, magnifying glass. And, and I, as far as I can tell, the new uh, digitized images are exactly what I saw on the prime film. It uh, really, so those of you who are working with those images, uh, I think can feel pretty confident that they've held up very, very well. NASA's uh, it's kept them refrigerated, the original film refrigerated uh, during that time, and uh, really uh, it hasn't deteriorated at all, as near as I can tell. Oh, I, I, one of the things that you, you have to be aware of on the, uh, this, this shot is that there's no atmosphere on the moon. So it's always a good idea to keep that in mind, <laughs> because that's why we, we learn so much about uh, the space environment from the moon is that there's no atmosphere to interrupt anything that uh, is moving through space uh, to hit it, solar wind or micrometeorites or the like. The Challenger, <coughs> excuse me, the Challenger is a, uh, uh, as I indicated earlier, a remarkable vehicle, did uh, very robust, did everything we asked it to do uh, during that uh, period of time. This picture uh, illustrates one of the navigational challenges we had in order to get to pinpoint landing. And, and as a matter of fact, we began to develop some of that, those techniques on the Apollo 8 mission. Jim Lovell and I worked out the uh, uh, landmark tracking techniques, and he first demonstrated them uh, uh, during the Apollo 8 mission, where you use this, the sextant, the star sighting sextant, in the command module to sight on small craters on the surface of the moon, the position of which we knew relative to the center of mass of the moon. And that gave us a chance to <clears throat> up, update our velocity and, and uh, position in space, the so-called state vector uh, uh, of the command module, which in turn was then processed by, we always considered our computers in mission control, the IBM 360s, I believe, that were filling up uh, a couple floors of mission control. Those were processed and then uh, turned around and adjusted to update the uh, state vector of the lunar module. And that was particularly important for Apollo 17 because otherwise the very conservative uh, three sigma error ellipse that uh, would be calculated by older techniques would not have allowed us to land in this valley. This valley, by the way, is deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's only about uh, seven uh, kilometers wide at its narrowest point, about 50 kilometers long from upper right to lower left. But if you look carefully right there in the middle, you'll see that uh, the, the Command Module America and Ron Evans taking those early uh, navigational sightings, which ultimately allowed us to land in the valley. Looking straight down, Ron took this picture, uh, and uh, that uh, little light spot, some of you in the front row can probably see, is where we landed. We actually, uh, Gene Cernan and I were busy on the surface when he took this picture. And you can't see us, obviously, but uh, the, uh, that spot is, due, is produced by the winnowing of dark, fine-grained material from the surface. Uh, and once you move away from that spot, it is very difficult to see your tracks. Now, here's the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter shot of our landing site that includes the descent stage. Uh, way off to in the right edge, that dark spot is the... Uh, I think I have a laser here. Here we go. That's the lunar rover. Uh, when we first saw some of these early pictures, we could not figure out what that dark material around the lunar rover was. And uh, still not quite sure. I hope it hasn't exploded, batteries haven't exploded or something like that. But I think it's just because that's where uh, 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 Gene Cernan did a lot of walking when he parked the uh, uh, spacecraft there and stirred up the darker material underneath that lightened area that you see in the, in the, in the right center of the picture. My footprints uh, headed out to the ALSEP site are those very erratic uh, path here. It uh, gives you an idea of the resolution of these pictures. And in fact, what really gives you an idea is that you can see the dual tracks of the rover. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the rover wheels are only about that wide, and they stirred up a little bit of the dark material. So really, the, you're talking about less than half a meter resolution here with these pictures. 
Now why, you'll have to tell me, somebody tell me, why didn't I deploy the ALSEP right here? That's a perfectly good spot instead of walking another 50 to 80 meters and putting it in not quite so good a spot. And I can't tell you. Uh, <laughs> other than things look very different when you're down in, in the craters rather than looking at it uh, like LRO has looked at it. We'll talk a little bit uh, more about one of these uh, aspects thing here in a minute. The first view I had of the right, uh, out the right-hand window uh, looked like a very typical mare uh, basalt surface. In this case, it's not totally typical because uh, it's, it, it, it's quite a bit deeper. The, the debris layer on it is quite a bit deeper than at other landing sites, partly for a number of reasons. One is there's a significant component of volcanic ash that's been uh, added to this regolith over time. The ash was actually produced about three and a half billion years ago, but uh, as micrometeorites and macrometeorites have stirred it up, it's been incorporated in, the, uh, in what we call the regolith, the debris layer that covers the surface. Also, the, the, ma the massifs on either side of the valley have contributed uh, some significant amount of material to it. So with an active seismic experiment that we deployed on the mission, we know that the uh, depth of this regolith averages somewhere around uh, uh, 10 to 12 meters. It, uh, uh, it, it is quite a bit deeper than elsewhere. The uh, metallic object in the foreground is one of uh, 16 restartable uh, uh, rockets, small rockets, 50-pound thrust rockets that uh, we use to uh, control the attitude of the uh, Challenger during flight. It, uh, just as in contrast, the thrust of an F-1 engine was 1.5 million pounds. So, you, and we had several different rocket engines in between those two uh, that uh, were necessary to accomplish the Apollo uh, landings. Uh, a, uh, a view of that same area out my right-hand window after a, a couple excursions is shown here. And for those of you who are gonna spend time on the moon later, uh, you're going to have to do something about stabilizing the surface if you're going to be, have a lot of traffic patterns. And I think there are ways to do it. Uh, you know, the, I believe it was the Scots that basically embedded macadam, and that's, a, that's just rock surface uh, for roads. And I think that may work very well on the moon. As you process this regolith for uh, various resources, you will develop a good supply of, of gravel uh, for... Uh, for uh, dealing with paths and, uh, and roadways. The, uh, uh, also in this view, if you look carefully, you can see a repair job. That's the fender, the repaired fender that uh, the commander somehow or another succeeded in breaking. I had spent a lot of time in mission control and I tried, after that broke, I tried to convince him that it would it would be okay, you know, mission control, figure out how to fix it, and just get some sleep, and they'll tell us what to do in the morning. I'd spent so much time there and done those things myself, I had no, I didn't lose a wink of sleep over that fender. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, Commander Cernan may have lost some sleep over, over the fender. But nevertheless, that worked very well. It stayed uh, put for uh, the next two excursions and prevented a great deal of inefficiency uh, that would be uh, related to dusting everything that uh, uh, that lunar dust uh, would hit. The, th the problem being is that when you drive on the lunar surface uh, with those, this type style of wheel, and I think any style of wheel, you're going to get a forward rooster tail rather than a rearward uh, rear uh, trajectory on the dust that comes up the wheel. And, uh, and that means that you're going to get uh, quite a bit of dust on yourself as well as everything else. You'll see some of evidence of that. But in this particular case, uh, the spacesuit is still quite clean. This picture shows you everything you need in order to uh, work for several days on the moon. Uh, of course, you need a camp, which is a challenger. You need a rover to get around. And uh, we ended up driving about uh, 32 kilometers uh, with that vehicle. Uh, we're away from the spacecraft as much as seven kilometers at one point. Never had any problems with it whatsoever. It uh, operated extremely well. Uh, the engineering uh, to prevent dust in the bearings was, was perfect as far as we were concerned. The, uh, 
The other thing you need, of course, is a small spacecraft in the shape of a human. Uh, and that's what you see in the middle of the picture here. Uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And most, most importantly, uh, you need the support of the American taxpayer, symbolized by the flag, of course. <laughs> the, uh, the spacesuit is, as I indicated, is just another uh, spacecraft. It has uh, uh, consumables, uh, water for, uh, not, uh, for cooling. We had water-cooled underwear. How many, everybody know that? We actually, you could not have worked on the moon in this suit or any other suit without water-cooled underwear. It, it was another enabling technology, somewhat mundane relative to a Saturn V, but uh, it, it, uh, this long-handled underwear had tubes of water sewn in it, and that water was cooled by sublimation of ice through a porous plug. <coughs> Excuse me. In the... Uh, in the back of the uh, portable life support system. Uh, this is an emergency oxygen bottle, which, uh, of course, we never had to use. The uh, total weight of the astronaut, uh, yours truly here, and the backpack and everything was about uh, 370 pounds, but divide that by six, and you have the weight that you have to manage, but then you also have to manage the mass. And, and in many pictures you'll see when astronauts are moving or even standing, they'll be leaning forward a little bit. It's a natural human instinct to get the center of mass, your center of mass uh, over your feet, and that center of mass has been displaced about two, two inches to the rear. Uh, I'm, I'm sometimes asked, did you feel like you were readapting to gravity when you're on the moon? And I, and I, I do, I do think I was readapting to gravity fairly fast. I can't quantify that other than the fact that we work for three days on the surface of the moon without any problem. I never, we, you have balance problems, but that's because you're, you're learning how to work in a one-sixth gravity environment. Uh, but uh, so I, I'm very optimistic that we're going to, once we're back on the moon and really do some systematic testing of readaptation, we're going to find that uh, we do not uh, that will simplify the engineering going to Mars greatly. That if you can readapt to one six gravity, you certainly will readapt to uh, uh, three eighths gravity. <coughs> A little bu space biomedical jargon there. Uh, there's that uh, fender again, a little close up. And you can see one of the things we use to clamp the uh, photo maps held together by gray duct tape, of course. Uh, onto that fender were uh, light clamps that came out of the lunar module. We had two of them. Uh, they were there in order to, in case we ever had to work on, with the lunar module in the dark side of the moon and didn't have uh, uh, good lighting. So we, we actually had, had lights, interior lights, but we never used them. So the, the ground freaked out very quickly that these clamps, which are tough clamps, would work extremely well uh, to hold that, uh, that repaired uh, fender on, the, uh, on what was left of the uh, dust flap. By the way, that blue object in the, on the back of the rover is a uh, uh, this is, not coming. is a, a portable uh, gravimeter. And we, we made uh, gravity measurements, lunar gravity measurements, over a great deal of the, uh, on, on all the traverses. And that, that uh, data now has been reanalyzed using the new topographic information that's come from a Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so we have an even better feeling for the, uh, the gravity uh, uh, profiles along those traverses. And it's illustrating, for one thing, that the, the, the floor of the valley below these basalts is extremely hilly, as, uh, as one might have expected. I have to show you this. This is the uh, volcanic ash that uh, I found there at the uh, rim of Shorty Crater. Uh, you probably, I doubt if many of you have ever seen this picture unless you were at LPSC or something like that. Uh, I finally got it, the colors right. The, uh, NASA never figured out quite how to print the uh, photos uh, so that the uh, colors could be uh, uh, represented correctly. Uh, 
And uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Ron Wells, a retired astronomer uh, who lives over here in, uh, in Virginia, uh, and his son were able to, to bring the actual information out of the film and to create these colors based on what I had described in real time while I was there uh, sampling this uh, material. And so those, that, that is what it looked like, folks. Uh, it was really quite uh, remarkably colorful. And you see a, a reddish core and a, a orangish uh, amount of material outside of that and then getting somewhat yellowish towards the edges. Uh, and, and that uh, ash, by the way, is, is telling us increasingly new information, not only about the uh, volcanic activity on the moon, but also probably about the origin of the moon itself. It, uh, it is like so many other lunar samples that we have, a gift, as uh, Clive Neal and others have said, that keeps on giving uh, because of the advance of technology and the advance of uh, understanding. And uh, people's thoughts are advancing all the time and what to look for. Uh, so uh, believe me, you can always have another mission to the moon. Just go back and work on the samples. <laughs> well, I don't recommend that as your only mission to the moon, but nevertheless, it's, all, it's there and it's going on continuously. And, not, and, and a great deal because of the continued efforts of, the, of USRA in sponsoring so many studies and uh, and other activities related to, this, to the reporting of the results of, of lunar sample analysis. Now, I want to <coughs> give you a little bit of uh, somewhat new science. So think the only role I play in lunar science right now is try to synthesize what other people have done, bring it all together and see if I can learn something new. And back in the early days of uh, pre-Apollo, Gene Shoemaker and his uh, merry band of field geologists that you see listed here had, had s often said that the history of the sun is going to be shown to us by the, by, in the lunar regolith, this debris layer that covers the moon. Uh, but we've never quite figured out how to, uh, uh, how to pull that history out of the surface. And I've been working on the deep drill core that uh, we collected at the Apollo 17 site, uh, located as you see here in the previously shown picture. And, and in that can identify uh, a variety of lithologic zones, uh, each of which is an, a, a new deposit of ejecta from some crater, and I'm still working on, it's a work in progress to figure out which craters contributed uh, any particular zone. Uh, and uh, then uh, looked at the maturity information that uh, uh, Morris has provided, and then uh, 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 Oyster and others have, have produced the nitrogen isotopic ratios in that. Uh, and in addition to that, we have one potential date. One of the zones of that is, pro is almost certainly ejected from a 600 meter diameter crater that's nearby, <clears throat> and that's, we've, uh, in a previous uh, work, we've identified, the, or we've been able to, to estimate the age of that crater is about 500 million years by a technique just recently invented uh, uh, by others called topographic diffusion. How, how, how rapidly does a crater change its shape due to the uh, impact of meteors uh, on it? And uh, so we have, we believe we have a date. So keep that 500 million years in mind. Uh, now the t one thing that for some reason nobody ever did was to take the maturity, uh, maturation largely due to solar wind sputtering and, and, and micrometeorite impacts, and Carly Peters up here and I are, and others are still trying to figure out the relative importance of those two events. But nevertheless, you, have, uh, you, have, you can measure the maturity of a particular surface uh, uh, by a, a special technique in which uh, nanophase iron is produced by either one or both of those processes. And, uh, and then the uh, nitrogen isotope uh, ratios here in the so-called Dell Convention uh, of the uh, uh, nitrogen 15 uh, 
uh, and that's uh, in relation to uh, a standard uh, of which is uh, Earth's atmosphere nitrogen uh, ratio. Uh, and w nobody apparently ever plotted those two things together. And, you, and at least uh, with one exception, they plot along a straight line, which tells you that uh, the uh, light isotopes of nitrogen are being lost relative to the heavy isotopes of nitrogen in this core uh, due to uh, varying maturation. Uh, not unexpected, mass dependency of isotop isotopic fractionation is something that happens in a biological processes and, and other things, but here you're seeing it happen as a result of the maturation of the surfaces. Now, what's wrong with zone S? Uh, and actually, uh, zone T is a little different too, and we'll see that in a minute. Uh, now, when you take that information about the maturation and, and then correct this ratio, this N15 ratio uh, for uh, maturation, look what you get. Everything is pretty consistent. Uh, it tells you that the uh, solar wind apparently tells you that for the lower zones in this core, all but two zones, that the, uh, this ratio of, uh, for nitrogen 15 was about a minus, it should be a minus 105 plus or minus five per mil. And, it, and, and for at least most of the accumulation of that core, uh, the solar wind had a, fairly, had a constant uh, 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 nitrogen uh, composition isotopic composition. And uh, at least prior to uh, 500 million years ago when things changed. Uh, you correct the nitrogen ratios for the upper two zones and they're different. They're not the 105 plus or minus five. What's that all about? And uh, one of the things that I, uh, I hope out of this data comes, we'll, we'll be able to get the burial ages of these various zones, but that, that turns out to be a tougher problem than I anticipated, and I'm not ready to talk about that. So, the, so is today's solar uh, Del 15N uh, a minus 105 plus or minus five? Uh, that's, that's the question we're asking, but why is, uh, when, is the corrected nitrogen 15 value for the Camelot zone T at 500 million years and the surface zone S uh, uh, at uh, minus 38. Oh, by the way, uh, Genesis gave us a, uh, an, uh, supposedly gave us a solar wind value for this at a minus 407 plus or minus eight. Uh, I can't tell you why that's such a big difference. There's something else that I have to work on. But we did get, uh, there is a, a published value from Genesis, the uh, spacecraft that crashed in Utah. Is that where it crashed? Well, let's look at this. This is uh, sort of a general view of the evolution of the sun uh, uh, over time uh, and uh, in luminosity, radius, and temperature. And right now you see where uh, everything's uh, ratioed to the current sun. Uh, so if you put that in terms of the, uh, what may be the nitrogen, uh, comp uh, nitrogen ratio comp uh, values, uh, and by the way, uh, uh, the, uh, this ratio for the ash in that you saw there, the colorful ash down in the bottom of that core, we had a core there too, is a plus 13. So it's very different than the current uh, solar uh, number. And so it, in that early uh, period of solar evolution, uh, the uh, ratio pro probably changed from a positive to that minus 105. Now we have the deep core zones that give us that 105, minus 105, but the upper two zones are telling us something's changed just probably maybe about 500 million years ago.
and so you no longer have this, uh, this ratio. Uh, and uh, the question really is, do the zones S and T, the top two zones, indicate an increase in solar wind, uh, nit nitrogen ratio, or a decrease, or an increase in the rate of maturation, or both? Uh, either one can affect the slope of those curves. And did that happen at 500 million years? Well, something apparently happened to the solar wind at 500 million years. Well, not sure what. Uh, but what else happened in cislunar space 500 million years ago? Something we geologists call the Cambrian explosion. That's when li uh, uh, life uh, uh, diversified and spread very, very rapidly, uh, estimated now at about 540 million years ago. Is there a correlation with what we're finding now in the deep core uh, with, uh, with that explosion? Was there a warmer Earth? suddenly that gave us that explosion. I, I went through this in part just to illustrate what the potential is to science, and earth science in particular, with their studies of the moon. And we've hardly begun. We really have hardly begun. Now back to uh, the mission itself, you can see how dirty I got. You think the science is, is difficult. <laughs> Yeah, that dust is going to be difficult, although there are many engineering, engineering solutions uh, to dealing with dust. The best one is never bring your suit into your habitat. <laughs> it's the primary vector for, uh, for dust. Uh, the, and, and for the biomedical nerds in the crowd, you see that vein in my forehead? That's the fluid shift illustrated. I'm still in one six gravity getting some fluid shift to the head, although You've are, uh, we've are, I've already lost a lot of fluid from my uh, system, but uh, still the, 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 your body doesn't have to pool as much fluid in your legs as it does in one gravity. Uh, by the way, one of the things that we need to think about for USRA, <laughs> just occurred to me, uh, in the brief period that we had the Biomedical Research Institute active, uh, we, we did a, a compilation of anecdotal information from the astronauts, Apollo and some of the early shuttle flights. That, that was, had a very limited publication and distribution. We need to maybe reactivate that. I think, I think it's getting increasingly important that we do, so we can talk about that later. Well, we left the moon uh, you know, fairly rapidly at about a, a half a G acceleration. Uh, the commander asked me to go out and get a really good picture of liftoff. <laughs> Uh, but I, uh, I uh, no, even in not anticipating a political career, I didn't think that would be a good career move. And we'll leave that to someone who goes there, uh, hopefully, uh, within the next five years and stays a while. Uh, the ascent stage of the Challenger uh, rendezvoused with uh, Ron Evans and, uh, and the command module for a couple more days of lunar orbit observation. And by the way, uh, we're trying to get a... Uh, use that color, uh, uh, cont that, that color uh, improvement of the photographs also to look down at Scopicius Gallus, Carla. And Ron Wells and, uh, has been uh, working that problem uh, uh, so that there's going to be some, there's some spectacular stuff at Scopicius Gallus when you, call it, when you get the right colors in the Hasselblad photography. And what's been going through here without me asking it to is our splashdown uh, and uh, the pickup by the uh, Ticonderoga uh, and uh, the Navy SEALs, actually in those days called the uh, underwater demolition teams. Uh, 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 number four were in the water and uh, had us, uh, had the inflation collar around the spacecraft and, uh, and we were good to go, except that we wanted out. That is not a very comfortable boat, believe me. Uh, you're starting to get heat uh, sink back, uh, a sink back of heat from the heat shield uh, into the uh, spacecraft. It's getting hot and it's humid, and uh, it probably made uh, a couple people feel worse than they did when they were weightless for the first time. And there we are. We are back on the uh, Tycho, and just had a, a, a tremendous time. It was a great opportunity and privilege for me and everybody else in the Apollo program to work it. Remember, there were 450,000 Americans involved, uh, and uh, the average age uh, 
throughout, throughout Apollo was less than 30. I keep bringing that up. <laughs> Young people are so important. And uh, the other thing that's important is to have a management environment that allows uh, good ideas to move forward quickly. Uh, that really made the difference. If, you, if there was a test problem and you had a good idea on how to fix it, the next morning, so that could be in front of the decision makers. That, it's just, that kind of thing has to keep, you, you have to think about that. If you're going to do anything in five years in space and manage the risks in space, you have to have an, what, the kind of management environment that, he, that evolved and eventually made Apollo successful. And with that, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions you have if there's time. Have time for questions? Yes, absolutely. Questions from the audience? Good. Yes, hello. I'm going to get in trouble today. Ooh, I saw a hand. <laughs> Steve Brody with the International Space University. You just mentioned the, the evolution of the management uh, structure. W was it something that uh, uh, you can quantify in some way or describe in some way? What, well, what I can certainly describe change? it. I can certainly describe the, the evolution of that structure. It, it really uh, began uh, with the uh, decision by uh, President Eisenhower and uh, Lyndon Johnson and uh, Mike McCormick in the House, Johnson in the Senate, to respond to the launch of Sputnik 1 with the formation of NASA. And uh, uh, if, you, if you're into reading diaries, I strongly suggest you read T. Keith Glennon's diary. Uh, which has been published and, and is, is a great sort of reference. It's hard to read diaries, as you well know, because <laughs> the subjects keep shifting back and forth. But uh, it gives you a good idea of, that er of those early days of, of NASA. And, and within NASA, uh, Glenn informed the Space Task Group, chaired by Bob Gilruth. And that group uh, uh, cut their teeth on the X-15 program, they were doing a lot of thinking about uh, lunar flight uh, that paid off uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, one of, some of that thinking by George Lowe had to do with lunar orbit only missions like Apollo 8, and that's why that went so fast. In four months, it was, con it was proposed and flown uh, back in 1968. Uh, and also, there was a, a willingness to make mistakes and to learn from your mistakes. Yeah, everybody was taking risks, and if the risks proved too much, you learn from that uh, experience. Uh, I think uh, the final major learning episode was the uh, fire at the Cape, the Apollo 1 or 204 fire, depending on who you are and how you think of it. Uh, and uh, that, I think, was the final major maturation uh, event of the NASA management. And from then on, it was pretty clear things were going to move uh, very fast, very quickly. And, uh, and, uh, and for example, in 1968, early 1968, there were two major problems that arose. One had to do with uh, uh, pogo or fluid vibration in the uh, Saturn V that had been launched. Uh, so I think it was a uh, mission was Saturn, was, uh, was Apollo, was six, I think. It was, anyway, it, uh, uh, that problem uh, was of concern. And also the lunar module was about six months behind schedule in being ready for flight. And that triggered Lowe, into, George Lowe, to propose the, the Apollo 8 mission in order to keep the momentum going and keep everybody focused on what the real job was going to be, and that is landing on the moon. Uh, all of that tended to mature the organization, but it, I don't think it could have happened without it being a very young organization. Uh, there's another uh, age, uh, group or another organization that uh, evolved about the same time without nearly the publicity, of course, uh, 
uh, and that's the nuclear navy. And it has stayed young, so you can do that. It is still a very, uh, stay, the average age doesn't change within the nuclear, nuclear navy, uh, just because of the policies they put into place and the management techniques they have to, uh, to keep us safe uh, uh, with that, uh, that effort. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, or not, but it was an evolutionary thing. But you, I, a lot of it goes back to uh, Gilruth and, and Kraft and Lowe and uh, Faget and, and people like that uh, cutting their teeth on the X-15 program and learning how to manage complex programs uh, early on. And then uh, that management system just evolved to get increasingly complex and incre increasingly large. But it, it, uh, it also helped for James Webb, Kennedy's uh, administrator, uh, to have uh, told Congress that the Apollo program to, uh, to accomplish the goal of putting a, a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth would cost $16 billion. Well, that's about what it costs, but his engineers has estimated about $8 billion. So Webb had doubled that amount, so we had 100% management reserve to deal with the unknown unknowns. And if you can't, don't have those management reserves to deal with the unknown unknowns, it doesn't make any difference how old your agency is, milestones are going to slip. And we've seen that far too often in, in government programs today, and industry programs, it happens there as well. You have to have the reserves in order to deal with those unknown unknowns that are invariably going to come up. And, uh, and so uh, if I were going to rebuild NASA, two things I would add to it, and I try to get Congress to add to it, and one is that a guaranteed management reserve at some level, I think you'd, probably 30% is a good one now because we know so much more. Uh, and that you give me a way in which I can keep this agency young. Sustainability is meaningless unless you can keep the agency young. Sorry. I talked to you all about that once before. So. Sir, I'm one of those who was privileged to see you launched at night hey. in 1972. How was it? I'm glad to see you got down safely. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Uh, of course, NASA was, uh, was paying for all that and, and supervising all that at the time, and now we see these various private companies, uh, in, and, and even recently a uh, uh, crash close to the moon from the Israeli private company. Uh, yeah, they, you mentioned they did a the, remarkable job, first well, time out, remarkable job. Yeah. So could, could the private companies uh, maintain themselves if there should be a, a bad accident? And my second part is when we get a, 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 broad, a TV broadcast from a Chinese astronaut on the moon, is that going to wake up the American Congress to provide the funds that, that NASA and these other companies need? Well, in answer to your last question, I have no idea. I thought they would, things that have happened in the past several decades, I thought would have woken, awakened everybody uh, long before this, that we are in a very serious geopolitical battle, and, uh, and, we, and space is going to be, again, a major player in that uh, battle. Uh, uh, Scott Pace alluded to that a little bit earlier. The, uh, but I think that's been obvious for 20 years, and, uh, and that uh, we, should, uh, we, should, we should recognize it. Uh, somehow Congress seems to worry about other things rather than, uh, than that particular aspect of national security. The, uh, uh, I cannot tell you for any given company, since I'm not on the board of directors and I'd, of any of these companies anymore, whether they can stand a, a serious accident, uh, particularly one that involves human beings. Uh, it just depends whether the, uh, they have made their business case to their shareholders and, uh, and that they can sustain the capital investment necessary in order to press on. Uh, to some degree, that's like having a management reserve, uh, and, uh, but you have to be very honest with your, uh, your shareholders, honest with your directors, have good management team, and I, and I think they can. You know, the fact that, uh, we had a, uh, that SpaceX has had a very serious accident uh, 
uh, at the Cape that, that does indirectly involve the kind of, of uh, uh, engineering approach that they make, uh, namely putting helium tanks in their oxygen tanks, uh, that, and they've continued to press on. So obviously they have, uh, they have found at least, tempor at least for the time being, a way to sustain their, their program. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Blue Origin activity is, is quite different than SpaceX in that it's, uh, it's funded totally independently of any outside investors for the most part, or has been. And that makes things uh, somewhat easier. You, there, you just have one person that has to be willing to sustain uh, activity uh, ac across a, uh, an accident. Uh, does that help answer, answer your question? Well, I, I hope we never find out. Yeah, I hope we don't find out. We always hope that. But remember, working in deep space now much more than in near Earth, Earth orbit, although both of them have the same uh, problem, you have to learn to manage the risks. The risks don't go away. What, you, what happens is you learn to manage them. And we did that very well for Apollo. We've done reasonably well with the space shuttle program and with the uh, International Space Station. But the risks don't disappear. It's how well do you manage those risks that changes. Uh, one more question. Thank you. Historically, um, Human expansion across water or land is driven by economics, and not so much the cost of doing it by the fact that you're going to get money by doing it. What is it that you see in space that would motivate that kind of a large-scale human expansion? Well, I wrote a book about that <laughs> called Return to the Moon, and, and I, I, there is one resource on the moon that potentially could drive that kind of expansion because it's a resource that can be used here on Earth to, uh, as, an, as a m much more environmentally friendly source of electrical power than what we've had in the past. And that's the helium-3 fusion uh, resource, the helium-3 fuel for fusion power plants. Uh, incidentally, in the production of that, you also produce the consumables you need in order to be active in space. Uh, such as water and hydrogen and oxygen, nitrogen, and uh, carbon compounds. Uh, so uh, if, if that infrastructure ever gets put into place, and I think it almost has to be done within the private sector, uh, then I think you can have a sustainable way to uh, bring space and deep space uh, into uh, the economic sphere of the Earth. Uh, now, obviously, that hadn't happened yet. There have been uh, significant developments in the fusion world, again, within the private sector. I don't expect uh, the fusion projects that governments are funding to be ever successful as a commercial venture. Uh, the tokamak technology and the, and the neutrons produced by DT Fusion are, just make that almost a non-starter from a commercial point of view. It's interesting physics, but it's, I think it's a non-starter for commercial activities, whereas helium-3, because it uh, even fused with uh, deuterium, produces protons, uh, positively charged particles, and uh, alpha particles, hydrogen, uh, ox uh, helium atoms, helium ions, uh, then you can go to direct conversion, so you don't have the nuclear waste issues, as well as it becomes a much simpler technology base, still complex, but much simpler. Now, the private sector, some of you are aware of some public announcements that were made by a company called Tri-Alpha, now TAE. Uh, they've been working on, a, on a type, another type of fusion, but the technology base is relevant to helium-3 fusion. And uh, uh, if that technology base is developed, then uh, maybe we're going to see something. But again, it looks like it's going to take the private sector and, and probably should take the private sector. I would be a great advocate of that. Uh, to make uh, something like that happen, to really give us a sustainable uh, economic presence in space. With that, I guess you want me to shut up. So, Let's thank Dr. Schmidt again, please. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I've got my hand full here.